Well, thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the 2013 Ausveg National Convention Great Debate. And before us are some of the sharpest minds in this field from around the country determined to slice and dice this most contentious of issues. The modification of crop DNA has fuelled fierce debate in Australia since the first ball of genetically modified cotton was harvested from a rural New South Wales farm in 1996. Since then, genetically modified plants have been grown in all states except South Australia and Tasmania, which have extended moratoriums, stopping farmers from propagating GM plants. Genetically modified crops are defined as having one or more genes added to their genome, introducing new traits to do things like uh, which may improve shelf life, nutritional value, stress tolerance and herbicide or pathogen resistance or to stimulate the production of useful materials such as pharmaceuticals and biofuels. Advocates of GM technology push its potential to alleviate poverty, improve farm efficiency and reduce environmental degradation. Critics raise concerns over unethical gene patenting, the potential impact to human health and biosecurity threats. Today's debate will question whether GM technology should be adopted by Australian horticulture. Our hand-picked expert panel consists of advocates and of critics. Paula Fitzgerald is the manager of Biotechnology Dairy Foods Australia. She spent her working life in agribusiness and science R&D sectors, primarily in policy development, stakeholder and government relations, education and capacity building, corporate affairs and media liaison. She cons considers herself an agriculture advocate and in particular has dedicated much of her career to encouraging science-based decision making to deliver a path to market for GM crops. Paula spent seven years with the CSIRO before moving to the broader agriculture sector to work with commodities and investment or, uh, or with investments or, or interest in GM crops, including grain, cotton, sugarcane, dairy, horticulture and red meat, and she'll be speaking for the affirmative. Unfortunately, TJ Higgins, who was promoted as taking part in today's debate, can't be with us, but in his place is a man who is equally qualified. Professor Richard Rausch is Dean of the Melbourne School of Land and Environment. His career spans diverse research, teaching, regulatory and administrative appointments in both the US and Australia, including as Director of the University of California Integrated Pest Management and Sustainable Agriculture Programs, during which he had the lead responsibility over two years to promote organic agriculture in the university. Rick was also Director of the CRC for Australian Weed Management and Associate Professor at the University of Adelaide and Cornell University. From 1998 through to 2003, he also served on the Australian Government Genetic Engineering Regulatory Committees. He's also served on GN Risk Assessment Panels for the US EPA from 1998 till 2011. Now, opposing the adoption of GM in Australia, we have Mr. Scott Kinnear, who's the founding director of Safe Food Foundation, uh, the Safe Food Foundation and Institute. He's a strong believer in the virtues of food processed naturally, establishing the Safe Food Foundation and Institute to ensure that the world's food supply is clean, safe, nutritious, full of taste, and produced in a way that enhances our environment as well as our social and economic systems. Scott originally trained in agricultural science at Melbourne University, where he majored in biochemistry. For the last 20 years, Scott's been embedded in the organic food movement. He founded and still runs Organic Whole Foods, was the former and founding chair of the Organic Federation of Australia, former director of Biological Farmers of Australia, and former chair of the Centre for Education and Research in Environmental Strategies. With him, Dr. Martin Strapper, Director of Biologic Ag Foods. He questions the merit of GM technology, focused, focusing on continued research in low, into low input sustainable farming. Dr. Strapper began a career in agricultural science 40 years ago and has international experience as a former senior scientist with the CSIRO. Dr. Strapper employs a holistic approach and is an expert across a wide spectrum of agricultural areas, including research, 
development and extension. From personal experience, he has found that low input agriculture is, the most, is most sustainable for producers, consumers and the natural landscape. His focus is on biological farming systems which harness the power of natural soil processes and practices which create healthy soils while reducing dependence on synthetic fertilisers and chemicals. I think you'll agree, they're all very well qualified. Can you make them welcome? Now the rules of the debate are reasonably simple. Each speaker will have seven minutes and they'll also have two minutes worth of rebuttal time. The one difference in all of this is that they're both the affirmative and negative sides are allowed two points of order which will each run for two minutes. Now they can choose when they decide to do that. That overtakes everything else that happens in the great debate. They get their two minutes and then we'll add two minutes to whoever was speaking so that they can deal with that particular interjection. As I say, that point of order will take priority over all other parts of this debate. So without any further ado, I'd like Scott Kinnear to open the debate. Okay, um, great to be here. Thank you very much. And in uh, hearing Rick Rausch's CV, I wondered whether we should swap sides. Um, two years promoting organic, that's great. Um, this debate is about really the hearts and minds of consumers uh, for the food for the future. What is it going to look like? And it, on the one hand, it's about a global or an increasingly global control over our food supply. So the companies that provide inputs to you, whether that's fertilisers, herbicides, insecticides or seed, uh, are absolutely picking up global uh, speed. Uh, and control, and obviously the key company that we know about is Monsanto with its ownership uh, of seed companies and its procure procurement regime over the last decade or more. The largest organic seed company in the world, based in uh, Holland, I know uh, the son-in-law of a director, and every year Monsanto approaches that organic seed company with uh, a request to buy them, and each year uh, they are rejected. Um, what we are on about, or what I'm on about, uh, and I did so study agricultural science, is looking at what we're trying to achieve out of the food supply. And I think it's, it's critical that all of us, whether we are producers or whether we are involved in the supply chain providing inputs or whether we are consumers, that all of us think about the global issues, and they are around sustainability, they are around food safety, uh, and they are around nutrition. These are, uh, without question, global issues. Uh, and if we're going to address those, that's how we should frame this debate. And when I look at GM foods in all of these three areas, I have grave concerns. Uh, both as I haven't been a practising scientist uh, since my degree, but I did major in biochemistry and I understand very well what's going on. Uh, from a safety point of view, GM foods um, have not been properly tested. Our regulators do not conduct research. They look at applications from Monsanto and other companies uh, by the pallet size. They read the documents uh, and what we describe as rubber stamp them. Um, the documents that support applications, by and large, are not peer-reviewed. Uh, they certainly haven't been double-blind peer-reviewed in published journals, mostly. And those documents are accepted by our regulators as evidence to support the registration of a GM food. Whenever research, and to contrast that, whenever research is placed... Point of order. Is your point of order? All right, stop that. You're two minutes 52 in. Yes, you have a point of order. You've got two minutes. So, I have to challenge Scott on his point about peer review and so forth for the, uh, the assessments. I mean, genetically modified foods are the most intensively assessed foods we eat. I'll talk about that a bit more later. But there are, in fact, a huge number of peer reviewed papers out there. Anyone who looks can go to a website run by our colleague David Tribe. You just have to Google GMO Pundit. And on that website, you can find about 600 peer reviewed papers about the safety of genetically modified foods. So the argument that there isn't, in, in, further in terms of the peer review, there's a global network of, of uh, regulatory agencies that look at these foods. There's a very le intense level of peer review, as I discovered serving on the Genetic Manipulation Advisory Committee. 
that in contrast to a, a journal paper that needs to be peer reviewed by only two or three or maybe four people, every data set that comes through is peer reviewed by probably 10, 20 people in each country. There's a regulatory peer review system that's actually far more intense than anything that occurs in published journals. And I think that's something we have to keep in mind in this place. Paul, would you have anything to add? Yep, thanks. All right, well, you've got study from there. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, well, of course, I'm going to uh, uh, debate what Rick has said. The point I was making was that the vast majority of the actual application data that is sent to the regulator is not peer reviewed. That's the point I was making. Perhaps Rick didn't quite pick up the, the nuance. Uh, and that is an issue for me and for many other independent scientists. Uh, there has been some good work done looking at some of the Australian applications uh, by uh, various people, one of them Judy Carmen, Dr Judy Carmen, an Australian epidemiologist. Uh, she's examined some of these applications buried down into the detail and found that a lot of the data there does not support the summary conclusions. We see that over and over again. Uh, Professor Heinemann in New Zealand challenged a particular corn uh, being registered or about to be registered or under application into Europe, previously rubber stamped in Australia, and uh, suggested that the, there was some serious problems with the data set that had been provided. The European regulatory agencies took on board his critique, uh, and they, uh, mind you, keep in mind that Professor Heinemann had also challenged the Australian regulators and had been rebutted, uh, took on his uh, issues, requested that information from Monsanto. Monsanto quietly dropped the application, and that product has never been registered in Europe. So safety is a real issue for us. Uh, there is a body of evidence that is emerging, whether that's uh, laboratory studies looking at animals, feeding studies showing significant uh, disruption to uh, uh, kidney, liver function, uh, uh, fertility issues within laboratory animals that have been fed GM foods. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and one of the biggest problems is, the, is, is simply public funding. Public funding from places like CSIRO, the vast bulk of that funding goes to moving DNA around and not looking at uh, the safety issues. Um, going back to uh, the sort of the hearts and minds debate, I want to sort of jump back again. Economics. Um, we want to be profitable. You know, everyone in the supply chain wants to be profitable. The growers want to be profitable. The consumers want to buy food at a reasonable price. And what we are seeing when we look at North America is uh, growers there and in Australia, I'm sure some of you uh, uh, at times are thinking you'd like to, to make more money out of your enterprises and why the chemical costs going up. Well, you need to realise GM is inherently linked into a monoculture production system and it's inherently linked into a high input production system. Our inputs are going up. They're related to the price of fossil fuels. It's inevitable. So profitability is an area where GM is increasingly coming under question. And it's why um, Martin will talk more about that as well. Um, one of the issues that, um, going back to or linking profitability to fertility, and this is anecdotal evidence, but very good anecdotal evidence, and you are vegetable growers in relation to corn and soy, corn, uh, being fed to uh, feedlot animals in the United States. Real issues with declining fertility being measured in uh, pigs, and cattle operations, feedlot operations. Growers who switch back to non-GM feeds are finding that those fertility issues disappear. The, the fertility issues have become such an issue that it is affecting the profitability of those operations moving forward. Um, I think I've got, how long have I got, Chris? You've got about three minutes. Three minutes. I think I gained two minutes there. <laughs> I also want to talk um, about leakages within GM crop systems, and inevitably it will leak out of vegetable systems as well. Um, Steve Marsh is a Western Australian organic grain farmer whose farm was allegedly contaminated by his neighbour with GM canola. He was an organic farmer. He lost 70% of his certification. He is taking a, a legal case against his neighbour. We believe it's the first of its type in the world where an organic farmer is litigating against his GM neighbour. It's a terrible thing that's happening and as farmers we are horrified that this is happening yet Steve felt he had no alternative other than to defend 
his right to farm, which is what's being challenged. Uh, two days ago, the announcement came through that GM wheat, test wheat from 10 years ago or more, was discovered in Oregon. The price of wheat out of North America, as a result, has dropped. There's been buyers out of Japan and uh, Korea that have dropped contracts. It's a very hot subject globally, and it does cause contamination. Uh, there's been contamination in corn in North America, about a billion dollars sterling corn, and Liberty Link rice again in the hundreds of millions of dollars of cost. You know, this is a serious issue when you're dealing with a public that is uh, very keen and very cl you know, clear about what they want to buy and what they don't want to buy. And I'd like to introduce the concept of a social licence. Uh, when we are thinking and sitting back and looking at the context of what we want from a food production system, we have to have a, f a social licence to be able to produce that food. There is no social licence, pardon me, for GM foods at this stage anywhere in the world. Uh, and um, North American people, a lot of the time, have not until fairly recently even known that they were eating GM foods en masse. And you'll often have it said, uh, no American has ever got sick from eating GM foods. But the reality is, we don't go looking. No one goes looking. Uh, millions of Americans have died since GM foods were introduced. Millions have been admitted to hospital and have developed disease. We simply don't know whether those diseases or deaths have been linked to the consumption of GM foods. Um, it's, it is a global experiment that, uh, that we should be very, very, very concerned about and is seriously um, out of control. The last thing I want to say, and I've got 30 seconds to go, is Professor Heinemann is about to publish in the International Journal of Environmental Sustainability a paper which shows that Western Europe has declined in insecticide use by 80 or nearly 80 per cent, or nearly 90 per cent, 88 per cent, since the mid-1990s till now. North Americans have only declined by 20 per cent. Herbicide use has gone up but to 108 per cent, and in, North, in uh, Western Europe, it's in North America, and Western Europe, it's gone down to uh, 80 per cent. So that's the comparison of a non-GM Western Europe to a GM North America. We don't need GM uh, to increase yields and reduce pesticide use. Thank you. Right, just so you're clear to, if there is a point of order taken, then the speaker's time gets added by two minutes as well. And now I call on Paula Fitzgerald, Manager of Biotechnology, Dairy Foods Australia. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Should genetic modification technology be adopted by the Australian horticulture industry? Ladies and gentlemen, my answer to that question who am I to tell you what you should or should not do? But what I can tell you today is this. GM crops are now grown across 170 million hectares in 28 countries, including Europe, by 17.3 million farmers. These crops are not new. They've been grown for 17 years. And while some may claim that's not long enough, I don't know about you, but the grey hair I've gathered over the last 17 years suggests that's quite a significant time frame. And as those 17 years have progressed, we've started to see more commodities and more crops come online with a move into consumer-orientated orientated traits rather than pure agronomic traits. Crops of GM cotton, corn, canola, soybean, squash, papaya, sugar beet and alfalfa or lucerne are now common. Lastly, I'm going to tell you something you already know, but this really gets up my nose. Farmers are not fools. Farmers are innovative business people. Farmers have adopted new practices, new varieties, and new technologies for as long as I can remember. If the proof is not in the pudding, a farmer won't do it again. So what am I saying? If GM crops weren't working for those 17.3 million farmers, they simply would not be growing them. Our farmers feed us. They are not going to risk our health and safety or our livelihoods, and to suggest otherwise is simply irresponsible. Almost every commodity in Australia now has an investment in gene technology. Of course, we should recognise that such an investment does not always result in a GM product, as the knowledge gained through this area of science contributes significantly to improvements in conventional breeding. 
but our federal regulator, the Gene Technology Regulator, has granted field trial licenses for GM crops in canola, cotton, wheat, barley, sugarcane, lupins, banana, white clover, ryegrass and pineapples. So clearly a number of commodities are serious about exploring the GM option. So why are they doing this? Well, because like all things, conventional breeding has its limits. I am certainly not going to tell you that you need to adopt GM vegetables to feed the world. But I'm going to ask you to think about GM as offering a solution to some of the challenges that you haven't been able to overcome, or perhaps to think about gene technology as a means to revamp an existing veggie to make it more attractive in the marketplace. There are many agronomic opportunities for gene technology, but today I'm going to look at things with a bit of novelty. Let me read you a blurb from a Canadian fruit company. Welcome to Okanagan Specialty Fruits, home of the non-browning Arctic apples. Our vision is to develop new commercial tree fruit varieties that offer exciting benefits to the entire supply chain from growers to consumers. The company's first commercial product, non-browning Arctic apples, is ideally suited just to do that. Modern science is revitalising the tree fruit industry and Okanagan Specialty Fruits is at the forefront of the revolution. We are proud to deliver this science to our industry. We are committed to transparency and partnership. All our products must prove that they add value to both consumers and the industry and exceed all food safety standards before being commercially released. Now what I can't share with you today is the picture of the delicious red sliced apple shown on the front page of the website. And let me declare my bias up front. I was born and raised in Orange in New South Wales where I picked apples from a tree and I'm pretty fussy about how my apples come. I'm simply highlighting to you an example of a company which has taken the bull by the horns. Browning is a problem in fruit. Personally, the brown apple in the fruit salad has always been a turn off for me. This company has used gene technology to stop that and they are now out marketing and promoting their product in a positive way. Their website talks about the benefits this product will offer the entire supply chain and it names the consumer, the producer, the packer, the retailer, the food service operator, the fresh cut apple processor and the juice and sauce processor. Let me read you one more example. Del Monte Fresh Food Company is one of the world's leading vertically integrated producers, marketers and distributors of high quality fresh and fresh cut fruit and vegetables, so they say. They claim their long-term vision is to become the leading global supplier of healthful, wholesome and nutritious fresh and prepared foods and beverages to consumers of all ages. And what does Del Monte have? A new GM pineapple with rose-coloured flesh. To create the pineapple, they have overexpressed genes from a pineapple and, ta and a tangerine, and in addition, modifications have been made to alter the flowering time of the plants to ensure more uniform growth and quality. Here, GM has been used to create both novelty and address consistency of supply. And both of those products I'm mentioning are currently progressing through the regulatory systems. Just this week, we've seen an announcement from the John Innes Centre about the development of a GM tomato under development, one which has longer shelf life and higher antioxidants, created with two genes from Snapdragon. So I would suggest that gene technology in some areas is on its way and these industries have thought about it. So should genetic modification technology be adopted by the Australian horticulture industry? My suggestion to you all today, don't answer that question based on this debate. Go home and seriously investigate the opportunities that this may offer. Ask the question together, and all of horticulture approach on this will be far more successful in a commodity by a commodity attempt. Harness the best scientific minds to help you with the question. Look outside Australia, look globally. But don't just rely on the scientists to tell you what is scientifically feasible. Grab yourself some savvy marketers and invite them to join the discussion. Perhaps you might create the Coca-Cola of veggies, if you like. Do not be threatened by opponents who are talking down Australian agriculture, suggesting some foods are unsafe, and hoping that their GM stunts and tactics will scare you off before you even try. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's not the Aussie way. Australian agriculture is a great industry. 
I am proud to work in the sector and promote it. We are on a path of constant improvement. We produce world best science. We have innovative supply chains and leading best practice farmers. This is a tool that may deliver agronomic or perhaps novelty options for you, and they may see veggies rush off the supermarket shelf. The chocolate flavoured Brussels sprout, the tear free onions, the non browning bananas, or the heart foundation tick humble spud. The opportunities are endless. Leave the door open and have a good look. Thank you. And our third speaker is Dr. Martin Strapper, Director of Biologic Ag Foods. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction, and thank you for being here to discuss, to hear the discussions, and to be participating yourself in this important topic. Because you've heard a lot about it over the last 15 years, if you have been involved with reading the newspapers and television, etc. So I'm speaking for GM3, a world without GM. Because from all the GM that has been released up till now, it's clearly visible that it's going on the wrong direction. Because we get environmental and human health issues all over the place. Like the soils keep on degrading. In the Midwest of the United States, they have now more soil erosion than ever before because the soils are dead and they keep washing away and blowing away. So you hear here from the pro-GM and the GM-free side, what knowledge, whose truth? Like there is science and science. Science that's funded by the industry and science that's coming from people with independence. They don't have a, a baggage with them, a, a wheelbarrow to carry to help uh, funding studies by the industry that wants the products. And that science-based is all relative because I put far, far more value in, and throughout my career, uh, people around me have said that. I put far more value on your knowledge on the farm because your knowledge is very important because you are on the farm 24-7. And every year you do the same thing, but you get different answers. Why do you get different answers? Because the genes are interacting with the environment. Like the way you manage. Sometimes you spray, and you get a chemical, and you get a completely different result. Something works or doesn't work. And you ask, why? Well, it's the genes interacting with the environment. The genes interacting with the management. And because that's such a complex system, that we never get the right answers. So we have to go a step back and we have to go from industrial farming, like putting chemicals and fertilizers in at set times, to the biological farming, the, the organic biological principles, to come closer to nature, how nature works. And it's a very important principle. Because once, and I was absolutely amazed as a CSRO scientist, to then visit properties where they had insect and disease resistant crops and fruits and veggies. Insect resistant. Insects didn't come, white fly, aphids, they didn't come and eat the produce, no, because the plants were resistant. Why? Because there was a healthy soil with high biological activity that pumped carbon in the soil, so you get high fertility and a biological network in the soil that keeps the plant strong, the cell wall strong, that insect and diseases can't infect. And that's a very important principle. And in the CSRO, like, because I'm a farming systems agronomist, I look at the big picture, how our systems work, not today, not tomorrow, no, in 10 years time, 15 years time, our next generation. So when the GM discussion started 25 years ago, I kept asking questions to the GM scientists. What about the long-term impact? What about a five-generation animal feeding study? What about 10, 15 years from, then, from now introduction of BT in cotton in the soil life? And they said, oh no, we, we, we study it so thoroughly, it's all covered. I said, no, you haven't done those studies. And like up till today, there's no study in the literature that shows a multi-generational animal feeding study, like five years feeding rats or mice with GM corn or soybean or whatever, to show them that they're healthy, happy, and fertile. Those studies are not there. Why? Because they can't get those studies to work. Because in CSRO, they always read, said, oh, this Irena Umakova from Russia, she had this study from long term, and the rats were dying, and the, rats, the pups were very small, and they were sick. Ah, oh, she doesn't know how to do research. So I told my boss, you do that study with the proper methodology and show me that the rats will be happy and fertile after two years. That study was never done. So you have to ask those questions about the real science behind it, because that's very important. So we don't need GM. And like at the United Nations level, they have now reports and studies that the United Nations says we don't need GM to feed the world. All this claptrap that the GM science says, oh, we can feed the world with GM. It's not true. 
because, like the numbers that uh, Scott gave before about the comparison between Europe and the United States, within the United States, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, now says our yields now are not higher than they would have been without GM. Our pesticide use now is not lower than it would have been without GM. Our profits per hectare now are not higher than it would have been without GM. Why our farmers use GM is ease of management, lazy farming, spray a crop with the herbicide, the weeds die, the crop doesn't die. So what we have to do, lazy, there's no place for lazy management. We have to involve ourselves with, with our plants, with our trees, with our fruit and veggies to see what's happening and then to go with the role to sense what the plant needs and that's the biological management. And then like typically in the broad acre farming, you go down with 50% in, in fertilizers, like you have the fertilizers in three to four years and you go down with 80% with chemical use. Very important statistics. And then the stress on the family, the stress in the household becomes far less. The chemical stress disappears because you don't use all those chemicals anymore. And the mental stress, the financial stress disappears because you don't have the financial pressures because the inputs are far lower, the, the management inputs are far lower. So that's the important part. And then go, so that's what we call now agroecological farming, to farm with nature. And if the whole world would do that, we can feed 9 billion people. That's what the United Nations level says. So the United Nations level says that, we, the grassroots, and many of you in the room are experiencing that, the grassroots see that, but the middle level, our governments, universities, state departments, companies, they're still in this field, oh, we have to get GM to feed the world. It's nonsense. It's a trick that they use, and they say with authority that it's right, but it's the wrong direction. Now, uh, Paula mentioned like the GM horticultural crops, like papaya, zucchini, they're the only two. And then, Banana is under investigation and pineapple. And then tomatoes were introduced but taken off, off the market. And potatoes were introduced and taken off the market. And of course peas, the, the TJ Higgins GM peas, they didn't work. So there are plenty of examples that, that, that for horticulture, for food production, it doesn't work. So with, if we only have papaya in Hawaii, because papaya evaluated in Jamaica and Venezuela were rejected, so only in Hawaii, and zucchini only in the United States, Europe rejected zucchini GM because the yields are not better. So would you, why would you need GM in horticulture? Why wouldn't there be more GM horticulture crops now after 25 years experimenting? Only those two successful ones. If it was so easy to do, there would have been heaps now. And because there are not heaps now, is that the genes are so complex, that they can't make the horticultural crops. So you don't have to start with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stapper. And now, finally, uh, Professor Richard Rausch, Dean of the Melbourne School for Land and Environment. Should um, genetic modification technology be adopted by the Australian horticultural industry? Maybe we should start by looking at why, since their launch in 1996, GM crops are grown across 170 million hectares in 28 countries, including in Europe, by 17.3 million farmers, most of the great majority of whom are farming less than a few acres. This is arguably the most rapid expansion of any agricultural technology in history. This includes cotton, which is at least 93% in the United States and Australia and 49% globally, corn, 26% globally, soybeans, 77% globally, canola in Canada, 96%. And including in the case of corn, a lot of the corn, in the, corn grown in the United, both in the United States and in South, America, in South Africa is actually for human consumption directly. These crops are traded glo globally with millions of tons imported annually to Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. And indeed, Europe imports more than 30 million metric tons of soybeans every year that gets fed to animals without any requirements of labeling or any other follow-up. So why is this happening? Genetically engineered crops have been broadly reduced the negative impacts of agriculture and environment and have improved the profitability for farmers and safety of farm workers. Now, who should we believe in this? Is it Monsanto, uh, people who uh, you know, support organic agriculture? How about the European Commission? Its Joint Research Center in 2008, for example, reviewed the worldwide economic and environmental impact of GM crops and concluded that GM crops have been adopted rapidly by farmers because of redu reduced production costs, increases in yield, net economic benefits to both small and large farmers, including benefits of greater convenience and reduced uncertainty. 
Over the period between 1996 and 2009, biotech crops yielded a total net global benefit of some $65 billion. This included herbicide uh, tolerant crop uses led to reduced fuel consumption, the adoption of reduced tillage practices that decrease soil erosion, retain carbon in the soil. And again, this is a conclusion of the European Commission. During 96 to, to 2009, the, 2009, the reduction of pesticides was estimated at 393 million kilograms. The European Commission has been working on these statistics. Other people like USDA agricultural economists as well. The simple fact is that farmers have seen the benefits. That's why these crops have spread. And this couldn't be more clear than in India and Brazil, where GM crops were ad adopted over large areas before they were even legal to grow. 25,000 hectares of B BT cotton in the Indian state of Gujarat before it was legal to use it. Certainly not promoted by anybody. It was Monsanto and collaborators that turned them in. And, and on top of that, in Brazil, 30% of the Brazilian soybean crop was GM before it was legal to grow there, despite the fact that even today, Monsanto struggles to get any kind of endpoint royalties from that use. It wasn't promoted by a company. People adopted it because they looked across the river into Argentina and saw the advantages that people were having. And there's more to come. In field trials already in the United States, there are water, fish, and corn crops being grown, and nitrogen use efficiency is being looked at in several places. So what about fruits and vegetables? About 13% of the squash crop in the United States is uh, GM virus resistant. But probably the most spectacular case is that 80% of the U.S. papaya crop, all grown on the big island of Hawaii, is also GM for resistant to papaya ring spot virus. Now I have the good fortune to actually see this project develop because one of my colleagues at Cornell University at the time actually did it. This isn't done by, G by some kind of multinational company. This was developed entirely by the public sector. Dennis Gonsalves, who is Hawaiian of Filipino descent, like most of his friends who are papaya growers there, worked on this at Cornell University, brought it back, but, and basically developed it with a small group of people. They got health and safety approval, and it's now grown and sold as a fresh food crop and is licensed for, import, for export in Japan. The crop, basically, this saved an industry on the Big Island of Hawaii, and you couldn't do it by just changing the soil consistency. It was an aphid-transmitted virus. So then, what then about the Australian horticultural industry? The challenges the industries will have into the future, in Australia and anywhere else, is that nearly all tree fruit crops and a lot of vegetables are, are vegetatively propagated. These include bananas, palm fruits, stone fruits, mangoes, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and so on. Most of these crops are, were um, very old in terms of their origin. They were selections rather than being specifically bred. And as a consequence, they're not really well placed to take advantage of the rapid increase in genetic information that's becoming available. And it's also very difficult to screen these crops. So let's take a look at what GM, particularly the ability to apply genetics more cheaply, so allow old but accepted vegetatively, crop, vegetatively, vegetatively produced crop cultivars to take advantage of the huge amount of genetic information that's now becoming available. The first major traits that would be available to any industry that would want to adopt these would include pest and disease resistance, like the virus-resistant papayas and squash, drought tolerance and water use efficiency, and improved nutritional traits. For example, if you just consider bananas alone, the possibility exists now to pr provide resistance to fusarium wilt, black and yellow cigatoga, add um, uh, high protein, high provitamin A and iron in the fruit. In principle, we could even bring back some of the wonderful old banana cultivars that basically dropped out of the market because of disease. Now what about safety? Again, the European Commission, based on their own research, never mind the fact that there's a, that Companies are required to provide data generated by themselves or paid for by themselves for risk assessment, like in all other areas. There's a lot of public sector research going on in this area, and the European Commission in particular, based on their own research, the cost of more than 300 million euros, reported in 2010 that the main conclusion that could be drawn from the efforts of more than 130 research projects, covering a period of more than 25 years of research and involving more than 500 independent research groups, wait for it, wait for it, is that biotechnology, in particular GMOs, are not more risky than conventional plant breeding technologies. They spent 300 million euros to find that out. They've also reported that no health problems have been identified in 16 years of use, despite the fact that people have been looking intensely. Let's just consider kiwi fruits as an example, whether we would pass the test applied to GM crops. It was developed really in New Zealand in the 20th, or 20th century by breeding efforts from a largely inedible fruit was uh, introduced into the United States, for example, in the 1960s. There was never any pre-market safety analysis of the fruit. 
At the same time, even early on, people discovered there were sporadic reports of allergies to kiwi fruits that nobody paid any particular attention to. We now know that kiwi fruits really can be allergic to people. If kiwi fruits were to be presented to the regulatory system as a genetically modified food, it would never get through the system. It's, it, it was introduced in our lifetimes and it, ha, it has allergenic potential. Those, that's the kind of scrutiny we have of, of GM fruits now. Thank you. All right, now uh, each of our panellists also now has two minutes in which to do a rebuttal of what they've heard. I've seen them all been uh, riding away furiously there, so we'll go first to Scott Kinnear again, Scott. Right, thanks, Chris. Um, I wanted to challenge Rick on his assertion in terms of the expansion. Just because it has rapidly expanded does not mean it's right. The organic farming, uh, ecological farming is rapidly expanding as well. Uh, and in fact there's evidence of decline in adoption of GM coming through. Uh, it's my understanding that the papaya uh, is declining in production in Hawaii now. Uh, GM canola in Australia appears to have hit the ropes as well. Um, the reports that Rick cited 2008, well two years later the IAASTD report which is the one that Martin alluded to, 400 of the world's leading ag agricultural scientists you know, putting together a two year uh, process to deliver that report comprehensively rejected biotechnology as uh, an important tool for food security. Um, the United States and Australia um, work as a team on these issues and um, threatened to withdraw and probably I think perhaps from memory they did withdraw their support uh, from that work as a result, which is atrocious. Uh, in India, there's a suicide every 30 minutes from farmers. Uh, adopting or who have adopted GM crops. So that's uh, a point that should be made there. Uh, I think um, uh, the rejection in Europe is worth noting. Monsanto's now pulled out of Europe. Uh, most of the big companies are pulled out of GM research and adoption strategies in Europe. Uh, so it's not a nirvana and it's not um, going as well as, as people would like to uh, say it is. I think if you really want to get a, an idea of the control issue, you should watch a film called The World, the World According to Monsanto. Uh, it, it's a very well put together film and it's well worth a watch. Um, finally on safety, BT toxin discovered in the blood, umbilical blood of pregnant women in Canada. Scientists said it, it's destroyed in digestion in the gut. And yet how can, why is this toxin turned up? So that's a point I'll leave you with as well. Now, Paul Fitzgerald. Thanks, Chris. Scott started today by telling you that uh, this is all about the hearts and minds, and then he and Martin set out, I suspect, to capture yours. He claimed that GM food is unsafe, possibly going to knock us all off. Martin then told us that farmers are lazy, and Scott's now told us that those in India are suicidal all as a result of GM. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think you know better than that. I think if he was serious about marking his products, he'd perhaps be able to do so without telling you all terrible and untrue things about the uh, other side of the food supply chain. Our opposition claimed today that our regulators are simply rubber stamps. Scott went on to claim he had some anecdotal evidence about uh, fertility. Well, I'd make a few points. Number one, I'd suggest my opposition might wish to see the data that's presented to our federal regulator, and I think I would suggest that our federal regulator is probably one of, if not the most stringent gene technology regulatory systems in the world. Rather than anecdotal evidence, I preferred peer-reviewed material. Now, the claims about feeding studies by both members of my opposition constantly challenge me. Because if this was such a grave concern, and they have been speaking about this for so long, then why haven't they commissioned these if this is such an issue and gone out and done them themselves? So I would question that risk. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, Martin's looking for a world without GM, and Scott tells you there's no social licence for GM foods anywhere in the world. Well, I'll simply reinforce that there are 170 million hectares and over 17 million farmers. And I'm a huge supporter of our Australian farmers. I don't think they're silly. Farmers wouldn't be growing this if it didn't offer a result. And so far, our consumers are eating this product. In Australia, it's clearly identified. So I'd suggest the social licence is there. And as I said to you earlier, please keep the door open and look seriously at the opportunities. Thank you.
Dr. Martin Stepper. Yeah, thanks, Chris. First of all, in, in all this debate, we have to think short-term gain for long-term loss. And like the short-term gain for everyone on the land, it always looks promising, and then you start doing it, but then you slowly slide into the negatives. And like in the United States, with 90% corn, soybean, and cotton, they can't go back because there's no variety anymore that's high yielding. So you can't go back if you have done GM. And then what Paula was saying about I was claiming about the feeding studies that CSRO didn't do at the opposition. Independents were doing it. Why not doing it myself? That's the trick. No independent can do an animal feeding study with GM food because you have to get this, the food, the GM food, from the provider, from the company. And those companies don't give it to an independent to get negative results. So that's, that's completely a fallacious statement that you make that I can do it because I don't get permission from Monsanto to do it. And Judy Carmen had. Uh, but lots of problems with that to get seed to do an independent study. Then we go to the breeding. Like breeding, conventional breeding, even though uh, Rick is this, this saying that it, breeding can't do it anymore, modern breeding with the gene markers, so we use gene markers, the biotechnology, the gene, to track a gene into a new variety, and then we can increase yields with 20, 30 percent. And in the United States now for, for wheat, they're doing a very good non-GM wheat with a 30% higher yield. So that's very important that the, the breeding can be done. But that breeding has to express itself. And you need a healthy soil. You need a good soil to do that. And like GM crops on dead soils, the soil stays dead and the yields stay low. If you improve your soils with the activating the soil biology and pumping carbon in the soil, then you get natural soil fertility, you get protection against diseases and insects, and you get very good stable yields, and then good breeding gives us the higher yields. And it's absolutely amazing to see that happening. So we don't, like it's not a single factor research, like only do GM. Now you look at the whole picture. As a farming system, you look at the whole picture, all the soil and the interaction, and then the crops that you grow, and then you get very good results. And then one thing, like Monsanto had on the drum still standing, it's degradable in 24 hours. But in France, two years ago, they lost the court case because it's no longer decomposing in 24 hours, degrading in 24 hours, it's lingering on. And those crops have 80, 80 to 100 percent less nutrient uptake, mineral uptake. The mineral uptake is 80 to 100 percent lower in those crops that glyphosate is hanging around. All right, and finally, Professor Richard. Yeah. Talk about here. One, the declines in production. If you go to those articles I referred to at GMO Pundit, you'll find lots of studies that look at feed that really were feed animal feeding study, and there have been no declines in production. In fact, the one case where there is an impact in production is that uh, BT corn has lower fumonisin levels in the kernels uh, because it protects the kernels against insect attack and the fungus that grows on it, and you actually get reduction. You, it actually controls some of the problems they have in livestock. Um, I just want to talk, Scott, the suicides report in, um, that you made. You know, keep up on the journals, Nature, earlier this month, or last month, had a, a one-page story that debunked that suicides in India have got anything to do with GM. The umbil umbilical cord case in, Ch in Canada, again, uh, there was subsequent follows up that it questioned whether they could even find the toxin in there or where it came from. I actually can't comment on Judy Carmen because she's filed legal action against me, and I'm under instruction from my lawyers not to say anything publicly about her, so I can't comment on her any further. Um, uh, the question One about minute. no social license, no social license uh, for GM. The fact is the Europeans are buying and, and feeding huge quantities of stuff to their cattle. They're growing GM crops in uh, Europe already. Spain grows 100,000 hectares of BT corn. What do we want in terms of social license? Martin told us that there were no long-term studies of GM crops. You've always missed Flachowski from 2005, where they used BT corn. It's an independent group. Martin, and one of the authors, the third co-author is from the Institute of Organic Farming, the Federal Agricultural Research Center of Germany. I'd like to think that that's probably pretty independent. Um, so th there isn't a global experiment with millions of deaths. And it, yeah, lots of people die in the United States. They have to file birth certificates on them. Nobody's been reporting anything that looks like GM. Western Europe has reduced its pesticide use. The most simple way possible to reduce pesticide use in Western Europe is reduce the um, subsidies they provide so you take the top off what the net profits are. But the data, if you actually look at the data, been analyzed by lots of people, um, it's pretty clear that across the board GM crops have res resulted in net reduction in pesticide use. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Look, and I know in an audience like this, there'll be many, many questions. We've got around about 10 minutes and we'll take some of them. If you want to make a statement, please keep it brief. 
uh, and you might like to say who you're directing your question to. So uh, I think we have a microphone that can go about the audience. There's a gentleman just here in the front row. Hi, my name is John Sade, and I'm um, a vegetable producer and marketer in Victoria. My question is um, actually to all of you. And firstly, I want to say that you all um, made some very compelling and, and very um, great points, and some supported by uh, really good research and, and some, obviously, opinions. However, it's given us all something to think about. But have any of you actually asked our consumers what they want? A quick answer to that. Yes, I definitely talk to consumers. Uh, there's a sign outside one of my colleagues' doors, though, at, at University of Melbourne, that I think is quite instructive. It was from Henry Ford. And Henry Ford said, if I'd asked the customer what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Sometimes we have to lead, not just follow. I guess I'd just comment by suggesting um, that we, we have had a federal government agency that over 10 years has actually tracked um, consumer opinions on GM, so I would I guide you to look at that if you're interested. It's a Biotechnology Australia, you'll find it on a website and it's market research done every two years for 10 years, the last of which was just done in 2012. So in the interest of time today, I won't go into that, but if you're serious, I'd encourage you to have a look. Um, but, but in those surveys, the, there's no progress in the people that accept GM. It's the, the people that are against GM is very stable. And like if we go back to consumers, the demand for organic produce is now 10, 15% per year over the last decade or more. So there are more and more people demanding chemical-free food and GM-free food, and they don't do it for nothing. They know that it's wrong, and they, you can say, oh, they, they believe the non-science that says that GM is, is bad for you. Well, it's part of the whole story that you have to get the real science, like the CSRO, doing those studies again, from all the studies that have been done by independents, and they say it's wrong. We can't do enough. And then also with Rick is saying, oh, there's been so much research, and Paula, so much research done on GM. Of course you have to do lots of research because it's a completely new concept. But you have to do that research in the right context. Right. And like if, if they call it gen genetic engineering, if one shot out of a million shot is right, is that engineering? All right, and on to Scott. Um, Biotechnology Australia, with their surveys, a, a point of caution, uh, I was invited to consult with them and other concern groups in the structure of the first survey, they never invited any of us back because we challenged a lot of those questions as Dorothy Dix's. The questions in any survey can be designed to elicit a particular response. So I just leave you with that thought. The latest survey um, over whether women in Australia would eat GM food, 66% said no, they wouldn't eat it. Uh, and. Um, uh, I'm not here today, Paula accused me, and it really got me quite hot under the collar there of, of marketing organic food by telling you scary stories. I'm not here to talk about organic food, we're here to talk about GM food. I can tell you lots of good news about organic food if you want to come and see me later. And I'm sure everyone will. Is there any more questions on the, on the floor? The gentleman over here. I'm Luke Alfie, I'm from uh, Oxtech, England. I'm an insect geneticist and genetic engineer. Uh, it seems to me that the, a big part of the, the reason why genetic technology is in the hands of big companies is the costs of regulation, which are in turn driven by the demands of the anti-GM activists, who then complain that it's in the hands of the big companies, which seems a little circular, a little peculiar to me. It also strikes me as a little odd that uh, you know, agroecological farm or organic farm will demand a GM-free world, but I don't hear, perhaps I haven't listened, but I don't hear GM farmers asking for an organic-free world. So perhaps you could uh, comment on these two apparent contradictions. Well, Scott, I, I think that this is a very important point. I think what he's heading towards is the right to farm. And the right to farm is critical to this debate, and it's, and it's the issue in Western Australia. Some GM crops will not contaminate. Um, you know, so really, I don't have an objection. You know, if you want to grow pineapples, GM pineapples, and sell them to the public, go right ahead. Uh, except, of course, I have moral concerns over whether they've been properly tested for their safety on the public. But where we grow crops that will contaminate uh, through cross-pollination or through accidental uh, food uh, transport and handling, supply chain management, then we've got to be extremely careful. 
This GM wheat issue in North America is an absolute sleeper issue, it seems, for 10 years. And Australia, every country that is now rejecting or, or having issues, they're testing in Europe, testing in Japan, uh, all these countries that are concerned about the GM wheat issue in Oregon, in the United States, are countries that Australia exports to. It was on the ABC yesterday that that is an opportunity for Australia. So we've got to be extremely careful, sir, before we release any GM crops where there's a contamination potential. OK, well, we've got a question down the back here. Uh, Chris, can oh, I... Sorry, can I, that's yeah, rich. I think the, the wheat one's an interesting one. I haven't seen data that the prices drop, but if it has, I'd probably rush out and buy wheat features. Because at this point, we don't know that this is something greater than individual farms, despite the fact that people have been looking at it pretty intensely. But, but I want to come back to, um, to, to the point about the size of the organic market and so forth. 170 million hectares is over 10% of the world's arable land. I don't think the organic market, certified or otherwise, is anywhere near that in size and scope. And that really says something about how fast the things have been growing. Well, right, we're going to take one more question. I'm sure our panellists are all here for lunch, I'll take it. And, and uh, if it's like every other conference I've ever been to, some of the best conversations will take place uh, once this debate has, has ended. So we'll take one more question from the floor. And yeah, then thank, we'll thank you, David Moore from Horticulture Australia. Uh, the, the question to, to anyone on the panel, really, this, this debate seems to be driven by ideology, and from my perspective at least, uh, it's driven by ideology and, and potentially anti-globalisation and anti-corporatisation uh, ra rather than anti-science. Uh, interested in your comments on that? All right, we'll let everyone have a shot at that. Yeah, I, I think there is a strong ideological component to it, there's no question about it. Um, Scott commented earlier that this case with Marsh in Western Australia is what they believe to be the first case in the world. I believe he's right. And when you think that GM crops have been out there for 16 or, se 16 or so years, you wonder why is it that the first case has occurred in Australia. In fact, when I was with the University of California in 2003 to 6, I made a particular effort to try to find examples of such cases anywhere in the United States, including California, which uh, we had individual farms that were growing GM, organic, and conventional on the same farming operation. And in my mother's home state of Iowa, which has the highest adoption of organic and GM simultaneously, nowhere could I find any cases of any kind of, of a court case like this. And that is because generally everywhere else in the world, as far as I can tell, there's a notion or the, the acceptance of some kind of level of tolerance, except in at least some of the cert organic certification agencies in Australia. And I just want to point out, Chris, if you indulge me for a moment, that it isn't always this way. That in 2003, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that there was expensively priced organic food sold in supermarkets that had been found to contain pesticide residues for pesticides that were already banned. And the response at the time from Andy Monk, who I think is a friend of Scott's, who was then the chief executive of Biological Farmers, said, um, he, certified organic refers only to the guarantee of chemical-free production, not the end product. We live in an environment where there are persistent chemicals. The organic industry never marketed the claim claim the product is pristine. That is to say, most certification systems accept tolerance for pesticide residues, even ones that have been remonstrably proven to have health risks, but we don't want to allow in Australia tolerances for GM crops that, despite what my opponents would like claim, have not been shown to have any health impacts anywhere in the world. Martin? Yeah, ideology. What's an ideology for, be for wanting people to be healthy? Yeah. Like at the moment, with our current farming, like our current industrial farming with fertilizers and chemicals, and GM is part of it and makes it stronger, that world is destroying the soils. The soils become dead. Organisms in the soil can't live. At the moment, the United States, the FAO, the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, they estimate that we lose 1% of our arable land every year through degradation and urbanization. 1% every year. How long can we humans still live on this planet Earth? So what we have to do is we have to regenerate soils, and that can only be done with biology, soil biology, and that soil biology can only live if we minimize chemical use and fertilizer use. So, and then we pump carbon in the soil, and then we get natural soil fertility back, and then the beauty of nature is that th those crops, those pastures, those vegetables have a much higher mineral content than our current mineral content, which is lower, like it, it doubles, it goes up with 50% to doubling in under healthy soils. So whenever you see comparisons between current farming and organic farming that says, oh, there's no difference, then you have to ask for that the comparisons are only valid if that organic property is on a healthy soil. 
Because lots of our organic properties are not necessarily unhealthy soils because they're just organic, don't apply chemicals, don't apply fertilizers, and then you get a tick and certified. Those organic properties have half the yield of their neighbor, but the modern organic property that manages soil health, the yields in normal years are the same as the neighbor. In dry years, it's higher than the neighbor. It's only the one in five very good year with higher rainfall that the neighbor is higher yielding, but that's all water and low quality nitrogen pumping into the crop to get high yields. All right, Paula. Um, I think you're absolutely right. So the challenge is how do we make sure that ideology doesn't stop agriculture going forward and letting us have the opportunities to explore new technologies and new innovations as we have done for decades. We're very lucky in Australia because there's plenty of food here, there's plenty of choice. I can get it from multiple sources, my large multinational supermarket or my little friendly grocer down the road. I think the challenge is for us as an industry, uh, we do great things in agriculture. For some reason, we don't tell people all the great things we do we've done. We don't talk about the innovation in our sector, both in our supply chains, on farm, in our science. So I think the challenge is we need to talk about those things. We need to take the consumer with us on a journey. We need to make sure that decisions made have a science base to them and not just what someone thought up overnight or is concerned about. And Hopefully here then in Australia we will continue to have choice which will allow our consumers to select whatever product they want on whatever given day. And the final word falls to Scott. Um, thanks Chris. Um, at the Safe Food Foundation we do put our money where our mouth is. We are investing in GM uh, research food feeding trials. As Martin mentioned, Judy Carman spent two years, two years trying to get access to GM material to study. And I won't disclose how she got access to it, because her paper is uh, uh, still to be published and it will be published. Um, we are investing in research in New Zealand and in Europe and in Australia. Um, I mentioned, you know, this debate is about ideology, but there are a lot of facts on both sides of the argument. Um, there's the GMO Pundit website, but if you also want to see a counter to that, go to the GMO Evidence website. There are dozens of peer-reviewed published papers there. Um, why is Steve Marsh's case the only one in the world that we can find? I think it's because common law litigation in the Supreme Court or the highest court of any land is extraordinarily expensive, and we're involved in um, supporting Steve with those litigation costs. Slater and Gordon are running the case under their public interest policy uh, and we are paying for the disbursements which are estimated at around $600,000 is what we have to come up with. If Steve loses, he will lose his farm. Short and simple. It will be a million dollars of costs against him. That's why people don't take this litigation very often. Um, but yeah, to finish with, on a lighter note, it is about ideology. Um, but you know, everything's about ideology. Every political debate, every time a politician opens their mouth, it's about ideology. The National Broadband Network, you know, I sat next to a bloke on a plane who said that this is the, and he was probably one of the leading experts in the world on broadband technology. And he said, we are blowing $40 billion. Now, that's opi his opinion, but he's a pretty qualified person to have that opinion. So, you know, every single debate is about ideology. But it's great that you're having it. And uh, as um, some of the speakers have said, I think Paul has summed it up very well. Um, dwell on this, think about it, do it as a whole of an industry approach. She's absolutely right in saying that, fully supportive on that. Um, thanks for your attention. Great. I think that, if I may be so bold, something that Scott said at the end there, everyone can agree with. It's great that we are having the debate. And I, recently I heard the head of the BBC's Urdu service on, on the World Service talking about the elections in Pakistan. And he talked about it being the most violent election that he'd ever co covered. Literally dozens of people died during the course of that political campaign. One of the great things about politics in Australia, no matter how hot the debates become, is that usually people don't die. We should reflect on that and that, that we can have people who have quite different opinions on a panel today discussing it in such a civilised way. I think we should thank them all. So can you thank them again? <laughs>